If we go back a couple of years, we'll find that early on, digital converters, or analog to digital converters, were very good. They're brand new. You know, and, and the speeches that I gave the other day, I, I gave a little bit of history of analog, and from the first analog recording, which took place around 1850, 1860, until about the 1950s, stuff sounded terrible. You know what it sounded like. You know what the old Victrola sounded like and, and the old, uh, you know, the 78s and stuff, scratchy, and you, there's no top, there's no bottom. For 100 years, it sounded horrible. Digital's only 20 years old. And yet, in the first couple of years, everybody wanted it to sound unbelievable. Well, the fact is, just like with analog, it took a while to learn what was important, what made, what made it work, what, made it, what, what didn't work. So when we first started doing this, converting analog to digital, yeah, a lot of people who were still used to hearing what tape did like to record to tape, then convert it to digital. I never liked that, and I'll tell you why. I'm a drummer, always, uh, that, that was my main musical instrument, was playing drums. One of the things that I always hated in the analog days, because I never liked analog, even when I was, even, even back then, one of the things I hated was that the front end, the bass drum, that, that initial sock, that initial kick of the, of the snare drum when it hit was always flattened on a tape machine. I used to have bands working out there. I was working with bands like Kiss and bands like Foreigner and so forth, and those guys would be out there banging the drums, and I'd hear it coming through my console sounding big and powerful and hitting me in the face. And then when I played it back off tape, when the band came in to listen, and I sat them down and said, this is amazing, listen to this. All that power that I heard when I was going to tape wasn't coming back when I played back off tape. Because tape has a lot of limitations, many of which some people like hearing, but I didn't like hearing it. I wanted that power. So what, it, what happened is digital comes along. Now, Here's the issue. Analog is very bad at those front end transients. Very bad. Doesn't pass the front end, okay? But analog is very good at harmonic content. Higher order harmonics, okay? This is what we call the grit or whatever. Very good at that. Digital comes along. Digital is fantastic at that front end sock, not so good at those higher order harmonics. Now it is, but back then it wasn't, okay? Because we didn't have great converters then. So the higher order harmonics were lopped off. All right, so let's think about this. Analog chops off the front end, but has good harmonics. Digital has great front end, but chops off harmonics. So, I record a drum kit on, digital, on analog tape where I've chopped off the front end, and, but I have the harmonics. And then I take that and put it on digital tape with no front end, which digital is good at. Digital chops off the harmonics, so now I'm left with the worst of both worlds. So, for me, never worked. Didn't make sense couldn't understand why people would do it, but they do, and I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking anything, because every time, whatever I say to you today, someone has made a record somewhere that sounded great that does exactly the opposite, and that's for sure. So what I'm telling you is I'm giving you the, the thought that I'm giving you information, but you have to digest it. What I'm trying to get across is don't let biases get in your way. Don't sit there and think because some artist says, if you don't do analog, it's not going to have emotion. Bullshit. Okay? Plain and simple. 
There is nothing you can't do if you have it in your head to do it and you know what you're doing. Analog, digital, great albums have been made on cassettes. An emotional performance can move you on an AM radio. It can move you in a, in a nice system in a car. It can move you on a television set through one mono speaker. It can move you on a high-end system. It can move you on a PA in a huge auditorium. All of those sound different. That emotional experience still moves you. Let's, uh, let's assume, because as I'm trying to explain to you, it's not really what EQ I use or so forth um, uh, in the mix. It's more about the process. But we can go through a little bit. Now, one of the things that I generally like to do um, when I start mixing is bring every track minus 10. Why do I do that? I'm going to be doing a lot of processing further down the line, and I don't want anywhere in the chain to overload the system. So I've found that by going to minus 10, I can do that. So let's take this track. Let's go here. And let's start with the drums. So, but I think I could love how's that for a drum kit, huh? <laughs> Nobody can get a drum sound like I can, I'll tell you. Okay, let's see. All right. Now, this, this particular song, the, the, uh, the drummer was doing a bunch of things in the first verse. I didn't like it very much, so all I... So I muted the, the snare drum and uh, the overheads in the first bit of the song because I really wanted it to come in here. So let's start it from here. Boy, something sounded loud there. Okay. Now, basically what I've done is I've added some equalization with this little device here from UAD, it's called a Neve 1073. Now, at my studio in New York, and in fact, do we have those, uh, do I have, no, let's see, do I have those, well, I probably don't have those pictures here on this disc, so let's go back. Um, I have, uh, I showed this the other day, I showed some pictures of the racks of gear that I have. And I have 16 uh, 1073s and 16 1054s, okay, that I have in my studio. Now, trust me when I tell you, this doesn't sound exactly like them, but it sounds damn close. And in fact, it sounds better if I put this across the snare drum than it does if I take an analog insert out convert it back to analog, the digital signal, but the snare drum back to analog, go into my 1073, add the same EQ, come back, convert it back to digital again, and bring it into my track, on, uh, bring the analog insert back. Whatever difference there is in this sound and that sound is totally lost by the, by the matrix that I have to go through to get there. So this sounds, if not exact, more than good enough, enough that I, who own these things, don't do it. I stay in here to do this. So uh, this is, uh, so, I, so anyway, um, I put this across the snare. I put, um, I put it across, uh, now, what do we got here? Oh, my God. How about that? Let's talk about that. So, let's talk about analog tape machines. How many have worked on an analog multi-track? Just out of curiosity. Okay. Okay. Then you all know what an incredible pain in the ass they are. Okay. For those of you that don't, let me just explain to you the, the, the hundreds of hours you go through every month aligning, fixing, tweaking, doing whatever needs to be done. Now, but the amazing thing is that anyone who's ever recorded on a tape machine knows that tape machine reacts differently to different signals. For example, the bass guitar 
which has a lot of low-end information, sounds great at 15 IPS. Same thing with the bass drum. Not so great at 30 IPS. Why is that? Well, there's a head bump issue that, that's involved. It's a, it's, a, it's a mechanical issue, but the bottom line is that 15 IPS works great for low end, not so great for top end. 30 IPS, on the other hand, works great for top end, not as good for low end. Now, 456 tape, for all of you that, that have done rock and roll, as I have done in the past, we used to use that for rock and roll because guitars recorded at plus six or plus nine, which is a standard that we use for level, sounded amazing on 456 tape. But overheads and things like that sounded better on scotch. And a lot of people in Europe were using this thing called AGFA or Bassif tape, and those had their own characteristics that sounded better with vocals or with keyboards or whatever happens to be. But no studio can have 50 tape machines, one for each track. You don't want 50 studers, one aligned at plus three for the drums and one aligned at plus nine for the guitars and one with AGFA tape on one machine and one with um, two 456 on another machine, that's just stupid. Apart from the fact that it takes 10,000 hours to get ready for every session and aligning those machines, it's just physically impossible from a monetary standpoint. You're talking about a million and a half dollars of tape machines. Apart from the fact that each one is about the size of, of a Mack truck, where are you going to put them all? Digital. Unbelievable. I can put 50 of these machines, one across each track, and on the drum track I can go 30 IPS, okay, and I can go on scotch tape. In fact, on the overheads I can go 30 on scotch, but on the bass drum I can go 15 IPS plus 3 on 456. And I can do that on every track. I can do it on the guitars, I can do it on the keyboards. Try that on your analog tape machine. You got one machine that can only do one thing and it's one size fits all. I'm not saying it doesn't make a good recording. We all know it does. For 50 years it's made great recordings. But this is better. This makes more sense. I can put this, I have this on, on this track. I've got it on uh, the snare. I've got it on the bass drum. I've got it on the guitars. I've got it on the bass. And then, forget it. This machine, if you look at it, you, go in, you can go under the hood here. Uh, where is the, uh, I automatically have this thing. On, oh, there we are. Now you can change the bias. You can do all this stuff without, without sitting there with the voltmeter and all this stuff, trying to figure all this stuff out, the repro EQ, all of this. Wow, another tape machine. This is an Ampex. Because I loved the way the Ampex sounded on my mixes, but I didn't like the way they sounded on, on, on uh, tracking. Same thing, I can go under the hood of that, Sometimes I use it at 15, sometimes I use it at 30, sometimes I don't use it at all. This song I use it because I was looking for a retro kind of a sound, so I use it. Sometimes I don't use it. I have no choice in the analog world of whether I use it or not. All right, so getting down, and so now I've got my drums together, I've made all my choices here, I've got my, uh, my EQs and stuff ready. I've added the tape machine where I felt I needed or didn't need it. Okay, same thing with the guitars. They're all ready to go. I start putting the mix together. Okay. 
So one of the next things I do, after I'm getting my sounds together, unlike the analog world, where you would generally take all of your tracks, go to a two-track mix bus, maybe compress the bus, you go through an SSL compressor or what have you. What, I've, what I decided was I have separate buses here. I've got buses, they're called S drums, S bass, S guitars, S keys, S vocals, S backgrounds. Those are buses for the individual, tra the individual elements of the mix. I take the drums and I mix them down to a stereo bus. I take the bass and I mix that down to a stereo bus. I take all the guitars, same thing, keys. And then in these individual buses, I'll do things like, okay, let's take the vocal bus. All right, starting off in the vocal bus, I put an 1176 on it. Then I put a really old time, this is what the Beatles on their console had, a Helios, okay? You can't find one of these in the analog world, so digital world, I got them, okay? Then I have a device that I own about three or four of in the analog in my, in my racks, but now recently just came out on, uh, on the UAD plugin called the Vitalizer. Vitalizer is made by a company called SPL in Europe. Amazing company. Do really kind of radical things. And they, in this particular instance, they've come up with a, a, an equalizer that isn't a standard equalizer. It works on harmonic content, and I'm not going to get into the details here, but basically it does things that you simply can't get with a normal EQ. It also has a tube circuit which you can turn on and off to add the, that harmonic content or not. Um, and so I use this on my vocals because it's kind of a dynamic equalizer and it makes the vocal pop out just a little bit more. So I'm doing this, these things across the mix buses. But I'm also doing things like, let's see here, well, the, we don't have... Unfortunately, I don't have the plug-in, but um, Sound Toys makes a plug-in called the Decapitator. And I'm using the, the Decapitator on the drum kit and a couple of other elements. They also have um, a device called the Devil Lock, which is based on an old Shure device, analog device, that literally just distorted the hell out of the signal. Now, I'm putting some of that in on some of these tracks. And in fact, I have a track there called SD Trash. Okay? Now, the devil lock is across that, but we don't have it here as a plug-in. So I'm just going to tell you that what I've done is I've taken all the drums, thrown it in there, squashed the hell out of it, come up with this distorted drum track, and just ever so slightly put it into the main track, just as a color. Okay, again, to add a little harmonic content to what's going on. So you'll see that that comes up at a, slight, at a lower level than everything else. And then we have the, uh, the bass I'm sending. What am I doing to the bass? I'm going, uh, okay, into uh, an API compressor. And, okay, some of the, this is standard stuff. Okay, um, basically... Let's stop there uh, because, you know, this is all to taste. Everybody's going to have a different way of doing this. But just let's say, so now I've taken everything and moved it into these buses. So now, instead of 30 or 40 tracks, I now have really all of these things are going. These are my, these orange tracks here are my main mix tracks. Those mix tracks are being sent now to what I consider my signature, okay? This is what makes my mixes sound the way they do. And it's these series of tracks here. Now basically, the first track that I'm going to show you is the S-mix track. The S-mix track is basically a submix of everything. This would be normally what you send to your two-track mix bus. This is but for me, what it is, it's a track 
that's uncompressed, it's my mix without any compression on it. And the reason I want that is because if I'm going to start squashing the mix bucks, I still don't want to lose the front end. So I go to a, a submix that is uncompressed, okay? And that's, that's going to be submixed with some compressed tracks and a secondary submix. But right now, that's, if you play this back, this is my mix without any compression, okay? Yeah, that's that. Uh, all right. So anyway, we don't need. I'll, I'll, I was waiting for the drums to come in, but it's okay. Anyway, 